What do you make of what you've heard so far? Yeah, I mean, my, my view is that the, the banks are still, it, the, uh, from a different perspective, from speculation, investing, betting on the price going up or the price going down, uh, the banks remarkably now are still the largest component, industrial or segment, if you will, of the stock market. They're still the largest component. And it, I don't know, it feels like technology had that great boom, crashed. You know, we're looking at a lot of banks where the share price lost 90% of its value. Many of them have gone up five or six times. Last year, we admonished ourselves. We said, well, you would never invest in a bank again. They've gone up five times, and now people are saying, no, well, I've got to buy them back again. Um, that's not my game. Um, I keep going back. Yeah, Alexandra knows this well, that you know, in the 19th, 1929, 1930, where we had the same um, collapse in the banking sector, where we had the rescue by, you know, by, by governments coming in, that we, we created the Glass-Steagall Act. So very much like you were saying with regulation coming in, is how can you combine being a, a good bank, a good socially responsible bank, with, with making money for shareholders? And the answer seemed to be, if you look at the performance of the banking sector from the bailout in 33, you made no money in banks. You know, it, banks became interesting 45 years later. You didn't lose money. Banks were just boring. They were just boring for 40 years. But when you've had a bubble, it takes, it takes 40 years. Look at Japan, it's we're 20 years through. It takes a long passage of time before they become intriguing again. But what do I know? Alexandra, you're more the sector. Uh, Hugh, um, is it too early to get into property, do you think? Uh, is this kind of one of these uh, <laughs> Pick and choose. Are you buying, Louise? Are you in the market? Well, I think, you know, what are you offering? Have you got a good price for me? I, I guess uh, everything's for sale. I could uh, continue. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? You look at some of these, some of these, you know, the values of homes at the moment, and yeah. some of this, some of it's been beaten down so very much. Well, Credit Suisse really? yesterday upgraded um, KB Home across in the States. They said the good, good valuations to be had there yeah. and a bit more stability coming into the market. Do, you know do you know how much I care about that? Do, how, do you know how Probably significant it is? Credit Suisse upgrading KB Homes. Well, I mean, I'm just making product. a personal yeah. point to yeah. the yeah. argument. Give me a break. Do, do you know what? You know, the, the, <laughs> We've already the, the, talked the, about our bras today. Can you can at least be similar to it with our house prices. It's because I'm drinking fennel tea, you know. But no, you. Many people would agree with you. Yeah. Um, many. Um, I would say to you that the majority of investors today believe that the last 30 years um, will continue. So the last 30 years, stock markets have generally gone up. Well, they've gone up a lot actually, but with these oscillations, the crisis of 87, the crisis of 1991, the LTCM crisis. Mm -hmm. and, and therefore, we've created the cult of contrarianism, <coughs> whereby you, when prices go down, you come in. So you're right, property prices, commercial property, um, there, there have been falls in price. Yeah? And people have been contrarian, and they're leaning into it. And they believe the catalyst is monetary policy. Um, I'm on the other side, which says the last 30 years were, were a moment in time, quite an extreme moment in time, which will now morph into something else. Yeah? And I don't, I don't really get my roadmap from the last 30 years. And so I don't have the confidence to be contrarian in that manner and buy things which are, which are still falling. And that's where we differ. But I haven't seen the future, and the people who are buying property haven't seen the future. We're, we're predicating our decisions on what's happened in the past. They look at 30 years, I look at 300 years. Because, yeah? I mean, you know, an adjustment is an adjustment, and, and, and people are going to continue to buy. You know, the world will continue to go around, and people need a roof over their heads, and all the rest of it. And yes. It, but remember, um, what, what interfered with that process was that we took on debt and we leveraged, mm -hmm. right? So now, debt in America. Um, America took on $54 trillion of debt. Now, to put that into context, um, the economy is $14 trillion. M3 is $8 trillion. So we actually, as I said, we supersized. It wasn't just Big Macs that we supersized. We supersized the world. And we invented a phantom world, which when, you, when people start retiring away from wishing to take on more debt vis-a-vis -vis their income, yeah. The reality is quite stark. The reality is you can't afford. You, know, you can only afford house prices in the UK, some parts of the UK, on the basis of being able to um, get a, you know, a loan to value ratio, which is, which is imprudent. You know, so as so banking. We've got rats on our, on our roof, but it's <laughs> <laughs> very big rats. Yeah, no, I hear what you're saying. I've got you wrong, Hugh, then. I would have thought that you would have been in the market to you know, snap up one of these little Miami condos that are up for sale now. Oh, that, you know. that's that. 
that, that's intriguing. The sun is always <laughs> intriguing. Um, and, and so, hey, if anything loses 80% of its value, then I think you're right. And with the tremendous overbuild in places like Miami, I, I, I expect that you'll be able to buy one of those unfinished condos, if you will, um, for an 80% haircut. Um, I suspect that. I, I, I can't say with any certainty. And so I might go, maybe we should go in December with the Miami Art Excellent. Fair. We'll get some sun and we'll Excellent. look at property. You know? Excellent. Uh, we've we'll got a uh, squeeze in a break. Hugh, we've got a couple of minutes to wrap up with you this morning. Uh, obviously, uh, our audience is, is looking at the closing up for the first half on the books. and They're trying to understand what they should be doing for the summer going into the second half of this year. They're frankly confused by the different economic indicators, some suggesting a recovery in appetite for risk, others suggesting that maybe this is a fool's rally. Yep. Um, so so it's, it's, it's tough, it's uncertain. Um, what has characterized the last five to seven years has been these vicious and quite wicked extreme turning points where it's like we're navigating the into the future with a compass which can only point two ways, to deflation or to inflation. So um, again, June, the hunt, uh, 12 months ago, it looked as if it was inflation, and lots of inflation, oil, $147, yeah, I'm amazing. And yet, and then the next six months, wow, vicious, vicious deflation, asset prices falling. And then just now we're back, and there's an appetite, you know, shells are by, yeah. corns are by, you know, index link bonds are by, yeah. sterling's are by, yeah? And I'm just saying, in, the, in a world where we oscillate to the extreme again, if you're sitting there and you're saying, how do I plan my financial affairs for the end of the year? Yeah. I would say, I would always keep one eye to planning for the vicious oscillation back to the other camp again, yeah. which is long duration bonds, dollars going up. Yeah. Very quickly, you're down, aren't you, for the year so yeah, far? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Down why about you, three or four percent. Why are you percent. down, if your call's right? My, because uh, it's not right in the first half. The long duration government bonds are down 20% this year. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm down about three or four. That, that's why I'm down. Yeah. Um, will long duration government bonds finish the year down 20%? I don't think so. All right, Cube, good to see you. Thanks very much for coming on this morning. As always, Hugh Hendry, CIO, partner of Eclectica. Let's just wrap up.